Man, I made it. Mayor, Mayor <clears throat> we're live. All right. Good evening. I call to order this meeting of the Greeley City Council this 15th day of December 2020. I would also like to welcome those viewing our YouTube live stream and those who may have chosen to be in our virtual webinar audience in order to participate live during citizen input and public hearing portions of the meeting. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance. I will now recite the Pledge of Allegiance and would ask that you join me in reciting it silently or quietly to yourself. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Gates. Present. Councilmember Butler. Present. Councilmember Payton. Present. Councilmember Hall. Present. Councilmember Fitzsimmons. Councilmember Fitzsimmons. Present. Councilmember Clark. Here. And Councilmember Zaseda. Present. Thank you, Jerry. All seven members of city council are present this evening. Item four is recognitions and proclamations. There are no proclamations this evening. I would call upon Councilor Zazeda to provide tonight's installment of what's great about Greeley. All right, at each council meeting, we recognize the people, organizations, and businesses that make Greeley great. Tonight, it's my turn to announce the recognitions. I'll start with a quote. If you belittle what you have, it becomes less. If you appreciate what you have, it becomes more. With these announcements, we are appreciating the good work of our residents, showing support for their efforts, and encouraging everyone to share the word that Greeley is great. Greeley Evans School District adapted physical education teacher, Judy Smiak, has been named as the 2021 SHAPE America Central District Teacher of the Year by the Society of Health and Physic Physical Educators. Greeley West High School cheer coach Brody Subia has been named the 2019-2020 Cheerleader Coach of the Year by the Colorado High School Coaches Association. The Rocky Mountain Workforce Development Association, a nonprofit agency partnering with state and local workforce areas, has recognized two Workforce Development Board members and one Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act participant. Weld County Workforce employee Sylvia Robinson has been named a Workforce Ambassador. Lisa Taylor, Executive Director of the Immigrant and Refugee Center of Northern Colorado, has earned a recognition for excellence in customer service for her efforts to translate COVID-19 information. And Abigail Guana, a youth participant, has been selected by the U.S. Department of Labor to be part of a national panel to discuss the positive impact of WIOA. And that's what's great about Grayley. Thank you, Kristen. Item five is citizen input. During this 15 minute portion of the meeting, anyone may address the council on any item of city business appropriate for council consideration that is not already listed on this evening's agenda. Individual comments will be limited to three minutes and must include the name and city residence of the person submitting the comments. Uh, because this meeting is being conducted virtually, members of our public have been invited to submit comments via email or traditional U.S. mail to the city clerk's office. Uh, Jerry, are there any comments this evening to be read into the record? Yes, Your Honor. We've received two emails. If I could read those into the record, please. Very well. All right. The first, uh, the first email is from a uh, Gay Clevin Huey of Greeley, Colorado. And they write, uh, I wish to express my dismay at an action taken by the City of Greeley Water and Sewer Board concerning the future quality of Greeley's water. As I understand it, Greeley may well undertake the pursuit of groundwater for the majority of Greeley's future drinking water supply. As a Greeley water customer, this is, this is most troubling. Since we moved to Greeley, we have had the privilege of having the best drinking water in the country. Uh, Greeley has some of the best and most numerous water rights in nor northern Colorado. I don't understand why the city is now pursuing groundwater with all the surface water rights that it owns. 
Our family depends on having clean drinking water for our health. Uranium is an undesirable element to have in drinking water, even if it is naturally occurring. There is no such thing as a naturally occurring uranium in the human body. I think that would be called a cancer risk. Uh, even if you attempt to, to, complete, to completely remove the uranium, you may not be successful and will decide to blend it in with the Bellevue water. The perception of uranium in the water will always be there and we will worry about the health risk to our families. I implore you not to go down that path. This will forever change the perception of the quality of Greeley's water and hurt our family's health and peace of mind. Aside from the negative perception of the water, the increased cost of treatment may significantly impact our water bill, as well as require a point of use device on our home to remove remaining contaminants from our water. I think that we should renew our efforts to obtain a permit to enlarge Milton Seaman Reservoir. Really possesses adequate water rights to see us through the next decade or so until the Milton Seaman Enlargement Project can be built. Please rethink the Water Board's position and make the right decision for the citizens of Greeley and other Greeley water customers who depend on quality drinking water for their health and peace of mind. Please vote no on the Terry Ranch Wingfoot Plan. And again, that is from Gay Huey of Greeley, Colorado. Okay, very well. And the second email received is from Joanne James of Greeley, Colorado. Uh, she writes, <clears throat> I am a 30 something mom and caretaker of my in-laws um, who may have been, who have been suffering from the side effects of COVID for a month. Uh, I wouldn't say we have done a perfect job of following the guidelines, but I have been uh, pretty careful considering we didn't want them to wind up in the ICU. It happened anyway despite the masks, the sanitizing, the dropping of just about everything we enjoyed. The above is just, the above is just a way uh, of, is just to say why I am beyond appalled at my outing today, Walmart being packed to the brim and the Rio having to burn two cans of propane per table for four tables worth of guests to sit out on the patio. Um, how are, they, how are they going to survive? We're not children. All of us understand this disease, what this disease can do to our loved ones. We will follow every precaution within reason to keep them safe, but putting a stranglehold on business isn't helping anybody. Please stand up to the tyranny of the state, uh, be courageous and encourage businesses to be courageous. The state clearly doesn't have our best interest at heart. Again, that is from Joanne James. And that concludes the emails that we've received, Your Honor. Uh, very well. To, to Gay and Joanne, uh, thank you both for reaching out. We appreciate very much that you took the time to communicate with us. We're also able to receive citizen input live in real time from those who've chosen to be members of our virtual webinar audience. Jessica, is there anybody in our virtual audience that would like to address us this evening? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Uh, but that will move to item six approval of the agenda. Mr. Otto, uh, I have a suggested change, but prior to that, uh, anything on your plate? Uh, no changes other than you wanting to move the UNC report up. So I'll allow you to do that, Your Honor. With uh, city staff and council permission, I would like to move item 18, which is a, a UNC update from Dr. Andy Feinstein, up right after consent to, uh, I was thinking about just calling it 11B, uh, we have a lot of public hearings tonight, and I uh, want to respect uh, President Feinstein's uh, uh, time that he has available. Does anybody have objection to that? Okay, with that, uh, we'll move item 18 um, to 11B. That way we don't have to tinker with the rest of the uh, numbers after 11B. Um, thank you for that. Item 7 is report from mayor and council members. Any reports this evening, colleagues? Uh, Councilor Butler, please. Yeah, my, my report is not to city council related, but I just wanted to say that I am the proud husband of a woman who defended her dissertation today um, and will be becoming a doctor in microbiology in May. That is fantastic, uh, Tommy. Our congratulations to Molly, not only for the doctorate, which is a huge accomplishment, but uh, also of accomplishment is the fact that she makes an awesome bagel. So uh, thank you and congratulations to Molly. A couple, of, a couple of brief things. Uh, Boy Scout Troop 202, if you're watching, uh, enjoyed very much Zooming with you the other night. Um, hopefully next year we can uh, get back to meeting in person. 
And I want to send out thanks to the uh, probably lots of people involved, but those that I know were involved were, were the city clerk staff, uh, Ms. Hollinshed and her staff for the 2020 holiday Zoom event. Um, you absolutely made the best of a bad situation where we couldn't get together. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed their time and uh, a little bit of fellowship from uh, the city this holiday season. So, uh, thank you for that. Final call for any comments? Seeing none, let's move to item eight. Uh, are there initiatives for mayor and council members this evening? Seeing none, Jerry, I believe we're ready for the consent agenda. Um, mayor. Uh, uh, Councilor Butler, please. Okay. Um, thanks, Mayor. So um, I've been speaking with local restaurants about the difficulties they're facing um, and are still facing with COVID. Um, and one thing I would like to see us do um, is something along the lines of a resolution and then some messaging um, from the city um, declaring a day of the week um, to support local restaurants. Um, I envision it something like Takeout Tuesday, um, where by resolution we announced that a day, um, a specific day of the week um, is a day to support local restaurants and have messaging from the city, social media and the like. Um, asking people to support our great local businesses um, that are really struggling right now. Um, I'd leave it open to which day of the week though um, and ask that we do a little bit of outreach to find out from businesses what would be best for them. Um, I'm fully support to anything we can do for our restaurants. Is, uh, is there consensus and or additional commentary with regard to Councilor Butler's initiative? Um, was that a question, Councilor Fitzsimmons or was that just a thumbs up? Um, consensus is there, Tommy. My only concern about how we do this now, after tonight, we don't meet again until January 5th. So does uh, Mr. Otto, do you or anybody have an idea how we might be able to facilitate that prior to January 5th? Because I, I don't see it. Well, I mean, we, if with council consensus, we can move forward to do some things administratively um, that regard, I mean, you can come back and then do a proclamation if you'd like to support it. But um, we will discuss some other uh, issues that I sent an email to you all out during the COVID response, um, and we can just incorporate that into what I'll discuss with you at the end of tonight's meeting. Okay. Um, clearly consensus for your initiative, Councilor Butler and the staff can move forward, and, and Mr. Otto will have some commentary about some things that have happened pretty rapidly uh, with regard to our restaurants within the COVID response. So any additional initiatives? Uh, thank you for that, Tommy. Uh, consent agenda, please, Jerry. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, tonight's consent agenda uh, consists of items nine through 10. Uh, the consent agenda is a meeting management tool to allow the city council to handle several routine items with one action. Once I have read each consent agenda item into the record, along with council's recommended action, council or staff may request the item be pulled off the consent agenda and considered separately under the next agenda item in the order they were listed. Item number nine is approval of the city council proceedings of December 1, 2020. Council's recommended action is a motion to approve the city council proceedings as presented. And item number 10 is introduction and first reading of an ordinance authorizing an intergovernmental agreement with Greeley Evans District 6 regarding land exchange and resources for a reconfiguration of non-potable irrigation facilities and a portion of the Boomerang South Nine, South Nine Golf Course, because the subject of the IGA is a land exchange hereby, uh, Greeley will initiate the dispossession of approximately 25 acres in exchange for possession of a like amount and other consideration. This item requires approval by ordinance. Um, and council's recommended action is a motion to introduce the ordinance and schedule the public hearing and final reading for January 5, 2021. And that concludes your consent agenda this evening. Thank you, Jerry. Boy, we let you off pretty easy tonight, didn't we? Uh, uh, council, would you have a desire to pull either of those items? If so, uh, please proceed appropriately. If not, I would entertain a motion with regard to the consent agenda. Your Honor, I move to approve consent agenda, agenda items nine and 10 as written. Second. Motion and a second to approve items nine to 10 as submitted. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Uh, motion carries seven zero, thank you. Um, item 11A now is pulled consent agenda items. There are none. Um, 11B is uh, what was item 18, University of Northern Colorado update. Mr. Otto, would you like to introduce our esteemed guests this evening? 
We're blessed to have uh, President Andy uh, Feinstein um, here to give an update on what's going on with UNC. And so doing, I just want to give an opportunity to, to say thank you for the friendship that uh, Andy has made with me personally, but the, the city and the community as a whole. Um, I want council to understand that one of his commitments towards our community was stepping up to chair um, the committee that was supporting uh, the food tax extension. And uh, it, we're blessed to have uh, a president of the university that is engaged as much as he is in our community. So uh, uh, Andy, um, it's, it's all yours at this point. And uh, nice to see you in a tie and everything. This morning when I saw you, you weren't dressed up near that nice. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. I've got to step it up a little bit, right? Um, but uh, thank you very much, Mayor, for uh, allowing me to speak. And and all the council members, I appreciate your time. Uh, uh, Councillor Butler, congratulations on the, the doctorate and the family. That's incredible news. That's a lot, that's just an incredible undertaking. So please convey my congratulations to Molly. So uh, I thought I'd just take a few minutes. I don't wanna take too much of your time and give you a little bit of update of what's happening at UNC. Um, we just finished the fall semester graduation. We had it virtually uh, over the weekend, which was very interesting. Uh, it went well. Uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, in Zoom land in breakout sessions, meeting with families and students for all of Saturday. Uh, you know, we we uh, we had a, a rough fall semester, like many institutions in Colorado did. About 15% of our classes were taught online. About 35% were hybrid, and, and, and excuse me, 15% were face to face. 35% hybrid, and about <laughs> half were online. Uh, and we actually did that, in, including up into uh, and after uh, Thanksgiving. Um, we had about 2,000 students living on campus, which is about 65% of occupancy. And we also set aside about 85 of our rooms throughout the semester to use as quarantine and isolation rooms. Um, and I think at one point we, we maxed at about 60 of those rooms being utilized for quarantine and isolation. We never uh, fully utilized all of them. And that's what was concerning me, whether or not we'd have to shut down the, the campus if we actually exceeded the number of quarantine and isolation rooms uh, that we had. We had a pretty robust contact tracing protocol and you can imagine every time that someone was sick, we had to reach out to uh, dozens if not hundreds of people. And we averaged about 400 individuals in our tracking protocol throughout the semester. And it was a mix of positive cases and quarantining students due to, to close contact. Um, looking at some data right now, we currently have about 76 people in quarantine uh, that are affiliated with the university. We have 28 positive cases right now seven are employees and 21 are students. And we're currently using about three of our quarantine isolation rooms right now. So it's gone down significantly. Uh, and at one point, right before Thanksgiving, we actually had it, we were had about 135 uh, positive cases. And so down to 28 is, is pretty good. For overall the semester, we managed about 2,200 cases. Those were that were quarantined and also positive. Total positive cases for the fall semester was 526 uh, individuals, 40 employees, and roughly 486 students. And uh, there's more information that you need on that. I'm happy to share that with you. Testing, uh, besides our, our healthcare center, we actually uh, procured uh, two SOFIA-2 rapid testing antigen systems that we have on campus. And that allows us to get results for testing in 15 minutes. Uh, it's, a, it's an antigen test, so it's not as sophisticated or as effective as a PCR testing, but it does allow us to do rapid testing. We have, uh, thanks to the state, uh, a curative testing uh, facility that's located right on campus, right next to the football stadium, and allows for online appointments. And we've had a lot of faculty, students, and staff utilize that. We're able to, uh, to manage you know, almost 1,000 a day there. Um, and that's obviously besides the one that just opened up by the uh, Family Funplex as well. Um, and uh, that curative site is, is open seven days a week, the one that's on campus. Uh, we've done a pretty uh, robust job of communications with the pandemic. We've got every Thursday morning at nine, we have a video feed that we share kind of like what you're doing right now. I, I bring my cabinet in and we talk about what's happening in each of the divisions and share updates with family and, and students uh, you know, across the country. Uh, regarding what's happened with enrollment, and this is probably the greatest challenge that we've had our enrollment is down about 10 and a half percent this fall and uh, certainly concerning to us. Our first time full-time freshman is down 25 percent. And, you know, when I've spoken to other presidents and CEOs across the state and seen the numbers, 
uh, higher education enrollment across the state is down significantly. And we're certainly concerned about that. We're not sure you know, what, uh, where these students are and what they're doing, but we estimate it's in the thousands of students that have just opted out to go to college in Colorado this fall. And we're certainly hopeful that they're gonna come back in the spring or in the, in the summer. Um, a little bit about athletics. You know, we've had some significant disruptions in athletics. Uh, I think fortunately basketball, uh, men's and women's basketball is up and running right now. And I think we're playing a DU tomorrow uh, in men's basketball. We have a football schedule that's slated for the spring. First game is uh, early March. We've got six games uh, planned for, for football and also wrestling and, and volleyball uh, and soccer will also be going on in the, in the spring. Um, the uh, other work we've been working on is strategic planning. We have spent a lot of time over the last year uh, implementing a Rowing Not Drifting 2030 strategic plan. And uh, I've got uh, groups of faculty, students, and staff that have identified about 10 uh, key action items that we'll be rolling out in the spring. Be happy to share that with you at another date as well. Uh, you've probably heard of the Ames to UNC program with Ames Community College. It was launched in 2019. And in our first year, we had 91 Ames students participating in the program. And this fall, that uh, has increased 127 uh, students. And we've actually welcomed 28 new degree seeking students who formally transitioned from Ames to, uh, to UNC this fall. And our goal is to increase that by at least 20% next year. Um, so I think that's the, there's some great work that we're doing with the Ames Community College and, and UNC as well. Uh, I'm gonna stop there uh, right now. I know that it's, we're kind of pressed for, for time a little bit, Mayor, but if there's any questions that I can answer, uh, for the commissioners on any of the work that we're doing, I'm happy to do that as well. You can have as long as you want anytime you come before us, Dr. Feinstein. Colleagues, are there questions for uh, Dr. Feinstein this evening? You must, uh, uh, Councillor Hall, please. I guess I'm just wondering what um, next year is gonna look like. What What's your uh, next semester? What's your plans for that? You know, it's a discussion that I've had with the other CEOs in the state. We are unsure. Uh, you know, I think we're hoping for a rebound uh, in enrollment, certainly uh, after the vaccines are distributed and people are feeling more comfortable with, uh, you know, coming back to, uh, to campus. You know, I think uh, having a larger percentage of our courses in person will certainly help with that. Uh, you know, we heard a lot of concerns expressed by our students that, you know, the online modality of instruction just wasn't uh, what they wanted. Uh, and they're expecting us to have a lot more classes in person. And I'm also hoping, you know, that uh, that will occur later in the spring. We'll be able to have even some in-person, more in-person instruction in the summertime. Uh, you know, if, if all goes well, I think we're gonna have a, a good rebound in enrollment in the fall, but I think time will tell. It's certainly uh, something that we don't have an answer to at this point. Uh, Councilor Clark, please. Well, just, just to talk about that a little bit, um, <clears throat> President Feinstein, I, my son goes to CU and it, it's tough. I mean, it's, I don't think he's getting the quality education, being in, not being in a classroom and he's not having a social life. So I think that's two things that those kids are, that's tough for those kids. And I understand other generations have had way tougher things happen, but uh, boy, it's tough to be a college kid right now. and tough to be a parent that wants to spend, spend 32, 35, $38,000 a year to have my son kind of stuck in his dorm room and, and not allowed to have anybody in there with him. It's tough. Councilor Clark, I, I completely agree with you. I have a son, uh, Nick, who's a sophomore at Penn State, and he's been home since Thanksgiving, doesn't go back to late January, and that's affected, disrupted his experience. And that's why at UNC, I have, I have really you know, worked hard at uh, trying to ensure that we have a, a high percentage of our classes still in person or in hybrid. So we had half of our classes either in person or hybrid all semester. And that was from you know listening to our students and hearing their concerns, and also having you know two thousand students on campus the entire semester as well. Now we had to make sure that we you know we socially distanced, that we masked up, that we practiced uh, you know proper you know hand washing, but we were you know committed at the university to try to you know make progress a degree for our students, but also allow them to learn and experience college life the best that we can. It was tough, uh, and you know I, I think it, it hit really home to me on. Friday and Saturday when, you know, we graduated a couple thousand students and we had to do it virtually. And it's not the same as walking across the stage and shaking their hands and looking them in the eye and also seeing their parents and, you know, and loved ones be a part of that. So 
we just got to get back to normal here and yeah. really looking forward to uh, the vaccine and, and looking forward to us, you know, whatever the new normal may be, I'm hoping that we see that uh, is significantly improve uh, next fall. Any additional questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, we thank you, Dr. Feinstein. You're doing a fantastic job leading our great university. We appreciate you very much and I'd like to extend a uh, thank you to your chief of staff, Dan Maxey, who I see out there on the grid as well. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. No, we, we appreciate you. And if there's anything that, that Dan and I can do uh, for the council or the university can do for this community, do not hesitate to ask. Uh, thank you. And that goes both ways, I assure you. Thank you. Take care. Item 12 is a public hearing and final reading of an ordinance reauthorizing various boards and commissions for three years. Uh, Ms. Hollenshed, good to have you with us. Yes, uh, I am on the line and Jerry is as well. And so we are available to answer any questions, but we don't have a presentation for you this evening. One, wonderful. Uh, Council, I'm sure you read the presentation. It's pretty short, sweet, and to the point. Do you have questions of either Ms. Hollenshed or Mr. Harvey? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Uh, Councilor Clark, did you have a question? I'm sorry. No, I didn't have a question. I, I was uh, jumping ahead of myself. No, no problem. Okay. Uh, I'll now open the public hearing on this item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Please begin by stating your name and city of residence for the record. Because this meeting is being conducted virtually, members of our public have been uh, asked to submit comments if they have any to the city clerk's office via mail or, or US mail. Jerry, any comments that you've received? Your Honor, it's currently 627 PM and we have not received any comments. Uh, thank you. We're also able to re receive public hearing input live from those who may have chosen to be in our virtual webinar audience. Jessica, anyone that's uh, out there that wants to speak about this issue? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, hearing no public comment, the public hearing is closed. I'll now entertain uh, discussion and action from City Council. Your Honor, I move to adopt the ordinance and publish with reference to title only. Second. Uh, very well. First and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Uh, motion carries 7-0, thank you. Um, item 13 is public hearing and final reading of an ordinance authorizing the city of Greeley to enter into an intergovernmental agreement concerning water services for 17 customers with the city of Evans. Sean Chambers, Water and Sewer Director, good evening. Good evening, your honor and members of council. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you and I have a brief slideshow I'm gonna share. So bear with me for a moment. Would you confirm that you're able to view the presentation? Yes, we are, right. Sean. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, what's before you tonight is action on an intergovernmental agreement um, and and associated therewith, we would be uh, transferring customers and an associated amount of raw water to the city of Evans uh, to allow them to serve these customers on an ongoing basis. Uh, the, the situation describes a little bit of discussion of its history, it's unique. Um, during the 60s uh, through the 1990s, 17 customers were issued Greeley taps some of them uh, actually connected to the city of Greeley, others connected to the city of Evans, but all outside Greeley city limits. Um, at the time, this made sense because most of the customers were closer to Greeley's service area than Evans, but as Evans has grown, they have become uh, inside the city of Evans. Five of the 17 are connected literally to the Greeley system and receive physical water from Greeley, although they're in Evans. 12 are within Evans and connected to Evans system, but receiving Greeley water by way of Greeley transferring resources to Evans and Evans making the service. Um, to date, no raw water dedication has been paid to Evans in association with any of these taps. Uh, Greeley handles the allocation of water by making an annual transfer to Evans. 
um, and the IGA and transfer of customers with assets to serve would eliminate this annual transfer of water. Here's a map so you can visualize uh, where this is at and how it kind of came to be. Uh, the dots up at the upper left, these represent the five uh, properties that are connected to the Greeley system physically, and the others are the ones connected to the Evans system. So Greeley's infrastructure to serve these customers is aging, and it needs investment. Uh, Evans is planning to replace and widen 47th Avenue, where five of these customers are located. Um, the cities worked together and negotiated an agreement to connect customers exclusively to the Evans system and provide raw water um, and thereby prevent Greeley from ongoing service to these customers outside the city and from maintaining infrastructure outside the city that's aging. So there's an opportunity to transfer the five customers onto the Evans system and to permanently transfer the other 12 along with their raw water. The benefits to Greeley, no longer providing service to customers outside of the service area, no longer responsible for maintaining and repairing infrastructure outside of its service area. Um, if Greeley were to keep the 47th Avenue customers, it would cost approximately $2.4 million to replace about 20,000 uh, linear feet of 8-inch water line. And you can see that highlighted in the map at right. Um, this is a future liability to maintain, repair, and replace, and it would be best to transfer the customers to the appropriate service provider. So digging into the terms of the IGA, as noted, we'd be transferring the 17 customers permanently, and associated therewith, we would be transferring about 9.07 acre-feet of raw water to Evans. Uh, Evans provides raw water through a variety of different share types, and so we're able to match what's needed to provide water to these customers in perpetuity with half a share of the Greeley Loveland Irrigation Company and eight units of Colorado Big Thompson. And so the value of those assets to be transferred um, equates in current market value to $562,500. So staff and water and sewer board uh, are in alignment around a recommendation for council approval of the ordinance with Evans concerning water service um, IGA. Are there any questions? Questions of Sean this evening? Seeing none, does that wrap up your presentation, Sean? Yes, Your Honor, it does. Just making sure. Uh, with no council comments, I'll now open a public hearing on this item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Because this meeting is being conducted virtually, members of the public have been asked to submit comments if they so desire to our city clerk's office. Uh, Jerry, any comments this evening? Your Honor, it's currently 6.33 and we've not received any comments. Okay. Uh, also able to receive public hearing input live in real time from those who may have chosen to be members of our virtual webinar audience. Jessica, anybody in our virtual webinar audience for this item? No, Your Honor. Uh, very well, thank you. Hearing no public input, the public hearing is closed. I'll entertain discussion and a motion from City Council at this time. Your Honor, I move to adopt the ordinance and publish with uh, reference to title only. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Uh, motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Sean. Item 14 is public hearing and final reading of an ordinance authorizing the sale of city owned property consisting of approximately 40.377 acres and located in the east half of Section 16, Township 7 North. Range 66 West of the 6th PM at Welk County, Danielson 2 Farm. Uh, Ms. Chambers, you're still with us. Good evening. Good evening, Your Honor, and thank you. Uh, before you on this action item is the disposition of a farm that was purchased in association with water rights. And again, I'm going to share my screen and quickly go through some slides that uh, will assist you and the public in being well informed. 
so as noted, the Danielson farm, Danielson 2, uh, was purchased with one and a half shares of the water supply and storage company. This is one of the water rights that is uh, very valuable to the Greeley system. You can see the farm locator uh, in the red dot um, quite a ways north of Greeley. Uh, this farm is under the water supply and storage company. So Greeley has um, taken the water in, has been leasing the farm back out, and is now in a position to sell the farm real estate without the water. Here's a closer aerial of the farm. Uh, Greeley acquired this 40-acre farm uh, for about $1.25 million, um, and of that, just over a million dollars was for the water shares. Uh, the, the value of both the water and the land have escalated uh, since the time of this purchase in 2017, uh, the, the water escalating more rapidly than the land, but the land has increased um, to the point where we would be um, netting a return on the investment by selling. Uh, we were approached uh, by Mr. Kerbs, who's a, a, a gentleman who farms and who's been a tenant farmer on Greeley properties uh, in the past about acquiring a farm. Uh, we identified this one as a potential. An appraisal was sought and came in at 242000 for the dry land farm, and that was uh, what Mr. Kerbs offered. The benefit of divesting the farm is it reduces uh, the city's overall maintenance for maintaining these types of properties, the potential for liability associated therewith. Uh, we can seek the reappropriation of these proceeds for additional investments in water resources. Um, and we assure ourselves that the land will be maintained in agricultural use. And we do that through a lease back as well. Uh, so the buyer is a farmer and will continue to use the property for agricultural purposes. Um, there's no brokerage or commission. There's $10,000 earnest money, and the buyer pays for the diligence. The city obtains a dry-up covenant and revegetation covenants to ensure that the property is used consistent with our needs and wishes to maintain the historic use of the water rights. Um, there's a lease back of the water for 10 years. While the city doesn't yet need to use this water in its municipal use portfolio, we, we make sure that it stays in productive agriculture and contributes to the economy. The recommended action tonight is approval of the ordinance and agreement for sale and divestment of the Danielson 2 farm property. Um, the Water and Sewer Board has also supported this recommendation for divestment. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sean. Any questions of Mr. Chambers this evening? Uh, seeing none, I'll open a public hearing on this item. Each speaker would be limited to three minutes. Because this meeting is being conducted virtually, members of our public have been asked to submit comments via email or US mail to the city clerk's office if they so desire. Jerry, any comments this evening? Your Honor, it's currently 638 and we have not received any comments. Thank you. Um, and we're also able to receive public hearing input live from our virtual webinar audience. Uh, Jessica, anybody within that audience that wants to speak to us tonight? No, Your Honor. Very well, thank you. Hearing no public comment, public hearing is closed. I'll entertain a motion and discussion from City Council. Your Honor, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the ordinances presented. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Uh, motion carries 7 0. Item 15 is public hearing and final reading of an ordinance appropriating additional sums to defray the expenses and liabilities of the city of Greeley for the balance of the fiscal year 2020 and for funds held in reserve for encumbrance as of December 31st, 2019. Uh, Mr. Carner, good evening, sir. Evening, Mayor, Council. We have our fourth and final appropriation request or corporate appropriation ordinance for 2020 for your review and consideration this evening. Uh, the appropriation request is about $23 million. Um, we have a few slides that talk through the highlights of those. I'm gonna hand it over to a familiar face of Robert Miller, a budget manager to walk through some of the highlights of the slides. Thank you. Good evening, Robert. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll go ahead and sh share my screen. 
with the fourth additional appropriation. Uh, this is traditionally the cleanup or final appropriation of 2020. Uh, normally we do go through all the items that are clean up with a large portion of this appropriation being tied to grants and other outside funding sources. I'll go ahead and start with this does allow us to make sure that we complete the projects that we started and also commitments that we've made. It does allow us to uh, record unforeseen grants and other revenues and it does allocate us uh, select fund balances. You've received in your packet a detailed listing of all of the requests. As John mentioned, we will only go over the main areas. We will not cover every single request as there is 23 million involved in this appropriation. As a reminder to council, we do appropriate at the fund level. So we do include every fund that we are appropriating in this appropriation uh, with the largest being the general fund. I'll go through some in detail what makes up that 11 million. The total appropriation is 23 million, which will bring the total across all funds to 625 million for the year of 2020 for the city of Greeley. The largest area that we do wanna focus on that has the most significant impact to the city of Greeley is the CARES Act or the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act. There are two parts to this. And we are not able to subsidize our revenues, but we are able to take advantage of the expenses that are incurred during COVID and many of the disruptions that we've had and also uh, the equipment that we need to purchase to keep our facilities open and safe. The total request for the CARES Act with 4.1 million going to the general fund in this request is 4.8 million. If you'll recall, we've already appropriated over 300,000 in a previous ordinance. We will receive uh, about 5.3 million uh, from uh, the CARES Act to help us balance the 2020 budget. The next aspect of it, a request in the appropriation is also for transit. Transit also received CARES Act monies that are distributed to the Federal Transit Authority. This is allowing us to purchase 11 additional buses at no cost to the city. Normally we would be contributing about 20% of the cost. Instead, we are able to purchase about $3.3 million worth this year and replace some of our aging buses. We were also able to use the CARES Act money to fund operations uh, with the additional costs that are incurred due to the current environment that we exist in. And this comes to an additional 620,000 that we expect to receive. Uh, in total, 1.4 million from the CARES Act and then the other grants that are listed there. We also do like to call out some of the funds that we receive from the police and fire every year. This does allow us to upgrade our equipment and also make sure that we're maintaining a high level of service. Uh, the police department did receive 820,000 in grants specifically for police related activities. The fire department also received grants. Most of their most of their funds came from reimbursement from wildland fires with about 338,000 of that 489,000. Again, between all of these grants and also some uh, intergovernmental agreements, we received 10.1 million in grants another 1.8 in intergovernmental agreements, which I'll explain a little bit later, for over half of the appropriation, so about 11.9 million. And this is key to allowing us to budget and balance uh, the 2020 budget. The next area that we do spend considerable time and, and funds in are in the water funds. Uh, as was discussed previously, uh, one of the consent agenda items, uh, we have an item listed for the boomerang water efficiency that will be improved for 3.5 million. Uh, we also do have some funds that need to move between uh, the existing water fund to water rights acquisition of 1.5 million. We also do have the Cameron Peak Fire Mitigation. This is just the initial amount that will be potentially future requests uh, to help mitigate the Cameron Peak Fire. And then the uh, operating transfer for transparency is listed below 1.5 million. 
capital projects, these are some of the major capital projects that are being requested. Uh, the largest being the 2.8 million for the Boomerang Fairway redevelopment uh, with 1 million coming from the general fund and the remaining 1.8 million coming from school district six. We also are moving forward some projects uh, with the baseline controller and uh, some capital improvement prioritization and Redarte kitchen design for a half million. These are funded by project savings and we're also presented to council in the five-year CIP. This allows us to complete them in a more efficient and cost-effective manner. The next one is a new traffic signal at 20th and 20th Street and 50th Adam Avenue to coincide with the Ames construction that is taking place for 450,000. The last one of note is the transit barn concrete replacement. We received a grant for 160,000. We are matching it with 40,000 in existing fund balance in the capital fund. The total request uh, for the capital projects is 4.2 million with a transfer of 17,000. Yes, Mr. Bob. Uh, just a question on the library parking lot expansion. Which library is that? That is in conjunction with Fire Station uh, 2 and the remodel. So it's... Uh, the next area is the general fund. We do cover each one of these in more detail in your packet. 294,000 would be used from contingency funds along with the two mentioned previously down below uh, for the Boomerang Fairway to redevelopment with School District 6 and also the new traffic signal. Uh, total contingency funds that would be used in this appropriation are 1.8 million, almost 1.9 million it would be in the general fund. We do have special funds that we are also a fiscal agent for the Northeast Colorado All Hazards Region Grant. This is a request to appropriate those funds that have been received this year for 418,000. Also the home or CDBG programs uh, that the city also oversees and receives grant funding from the federal government for 292,000. The special funds are for a total of 753,000. As mentioned, the total appropriation is 23 million. It does allow us to meet all of our commitments and brings forth the transparency and meets the accounting standards that we are required to maintain as a city. It also allows for the transparency and use of those restricted funds that are then approved by council to be spent. If there are any questions or any questions on any of the items that I have not presented or any of the detail in the packet, We'd be open to any of those at this time. Any questions, Council? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Robert. Uh, I'll open a public hearing on this item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Because this meeting is being conducted virtually, members of the public have been asked to submit comments if they so desire to our city clerk's office. Jerry, any commentary this evening? Your Honor, it's currently 648 and we've not received any comments. Thank you. Um, and Jessica, is there anybody in our virtual webinar audience to speak to us with regard to this item? No, Your Honor. Very well, hearing no public comment, the public hearing is closed and I'll entertain discussion and action City Council. Your Honor, I move we adopt the through. ordinance and publish for reference to title only. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Uh, motion carries 7 0. Item 16 is public hearing and final reading of an ordinance amending uh, 2.04.070 of the Greeley Municipal Code establishing the salary for the mayor and the salary for members of the Greeley City Council. Ms. Gonzalez Estevez, please. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you again. Um, I have a presentation I would like to share. So if you give me a second, I will uh, pull it up. Certainly. <clears throat> okay, can everybody see that? 
Yes. Okay. Um, so basically, let me give you some context around, as you, as the mayor said, the section 204070, oh, sorry, my, my mouse is very delicate this night, uh, requires uh, council to review the compensation for every council member every four years. And the last revision was done in uh, 2016. So we are in that uh, time of the revision again. So I have prepared a, a presentation for you regarding the numbers. Uh, we review the compensation and compare it to other municipalities and I will offer you that information in a second. Uh, and I wanted to remind council that you make the decisions for your successor. So that's why the years are so weird and off. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, on my next slide. Um, this is when the changes will take uh, effect. Um, it doesn't matter who the incumbent is, uh, who the person will be in the position. Um, so for each, for each one of the wards, um, that's the year when the changes will be taken in, uh, in effect. So um, as, as we go through the, through the data, and I'm gonna show you the comparison between the cities, uh, there is no increase proposed for the mayor because the mayor uh, compensation is within the um, average of other cities. Um, Ward two, three, and, and a large will have one month increase after the election in 2021. And then Ward one, a large and Ward uh, four will be increased in 2023. That's the, the summary of the previous table. Now, if you allow me to show you, uh, this is the compensation data where Greeley is in blue. Okay, this is the last time that we updated. This is where you are uh, uh, right now. This is the compensation for, for several cities around um, and, and similar to, to the city of Greeley. So I'm gonna leave this up a little second so you can uh, realize what the uh, other cities are, are at. And as you can see, the only one that hasn't updated yet is Thornton. Everybody else has updated as 2020. So basically what we did with this data is that we created, uh, so this is where we are currently. And then uh, we calculated the average for all the cities. And this is how we came up, came up to the proposal. Um, so the mayor will stay at the 18,000 and the uh, council members will be increased uh, to $12,600. Then um, I would like to show you what the financial implications is for every one of the years. So it will be $150 on 2021, 1822, 1915, 23, and 3600 in 2024 for a total of $7,500 total. So, I mean, as I told you, it was very, it's a very brief presentation. So I will entertain any questions that the council or the public may have regarding this. Questions of Ms. Gonzalez this evening. Councilor Butler? Yeah, I just had a question about how this is decided in other cities. Um, do they also vote on their own compensation? Uh, I, I'm not sure how they, every, every one city uh, vote or decide on their compensation. I will have to do some research on that, Council, Council Member Butler. As part though, Tommy, of her first comment was we're really not voting on our own compensation. Uh, each of our compensations were determined in 2016, and this will be for, um, you know, the future. Yeah, and I get that distinction. It's just, yeah, it still strikes me the wrong way. I'm probably going to be voting no. For what it's worth, Councilmember Butler, it is my understanding that this is a pretty standard process in, in uh, other organizations or other governments from that standpoint and normally does have the same types of restrictions that we have on you can't vote on your own. Um, but if you were reelected, then you would be entitled to that. Hey, Tommy, you gotta, you gotta win again to get the benefit. <laughs> we all do, but I'm well, just saying. <laughs> Any additional questions, Councilor Hall? Mr. Mayor, and I will say that that's the way the county commission does it, and that's the way the state legislature does it. They all vote on their own, but they don't vote for areas that are within their their general um, term. Additional questions? Ms. Gonzalez, is, is there a chance that, that we could all get the same pay that the mayor gets or no? <laughs> 
I think that's a decision and a discussion that we can have on a work uh, on a work <laughs> well, session. I don't want to have that discussion. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, but with that little extra cash, I will nope. pass on a few extra headaches. <laughs> Seeing no additional questions, this is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing at this time. Uh, each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Uh, due to our virtual nature, members of the public have been asked to submit comments to the city clerk's office if they have any. Jerry, any comments this evening? Your Honor, it's currently 6.55 and we've not received any comments. Okay. And uh, Jessica, is there anybody in our virtual webinar audience that would like to address us with regard to this item? No, Your Honor. Okay. Hearing no public comment, the public hearing is closed. I'll entertain a discussion and a motion from City Council. Your Honor, I move to approve the ordinance. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Aye. A motion carries 6 1. Thank you. Item 17. Is a public hearing and final reading of an ordinance to consider a change of zone from IL industrial low intensity to RM residential medium intensity, for approximately 0 0.870 acres located at 134, 140, and 148 14th Avenue, known as the 14th Avenue rezone and changing the official zoning map to reflect the same. Um, Mr. Mueller, good evening, or Brittany, are you, are you filling in this evening? Yes, Your Honor, I will be presenting this one. Good evening to you. Welcome. Good evening, members of council. Pull up my PowerPoint. Does everybody see that okay? Yes. Great. So as you mentioned, this is a request to rezone 0.87 acres of city-owned property from industrial low intensity to residential medium density. The surrounding area is primarily zoned industrial low. Uh, to the west, our property is zoned residential high density and commercial low. And there's also commercial low zoning on the south side of 2nd Street. Uh, the surrounding area is primarily residential in spite of the industrial zoning. The area is similar to that of Sunrise uh, with the industrial zoning within a historically residential neighborhood. There are also the Island Grove Village apartments on the west side with single family um, home on a commercial zoned lot south of the apartments. Uh, single family homes immediately surround the subject properties. They were constructed between 1915 and 1940 according to county records. Uh, there is also a church just south along 2nd Street. So the sites were platted in 1905 and 1910 and are currently vacant. The northern lot has been zoned industrial since 1949 and a south lot since 1958. And the south lot was zoned commercial prior to 1958. Uh, the city is requesting to rezone the subject properties to residential medium density to allow for the private development of affordable housing in the area. And also ensures that the lots are restricted to residential development prior to the sale. Um, this would ensure compatibility and lessening the blight of that industrial zoning in the neighborhood. So this slide and the next are photos of these sites. Uh, this one's looking east, uh, showing the alley. Um, and the lots are primarily flat and covered in dirt and gravel at the moment. And this one's again looking towards the alley and showing the um, attached sidewalk uh, looking south. So the request does comply with applicable reason criteria found in sections 1830.050, C3, B, E, F, G, and H, uh, which are listed on this slide. Uh, it's also detailed in the staff report. Uh, to summarize, they were initially zoned in 1949-1958. Lots have been vacant for well over 15 years. Uh, the proposed zoning is necessary in order to allow for the expansion of a historical residential use um, within the area and it addresses the goals within the strategic housing plan. Um, it also complies with goals and criteria found within the Imagine Greeley Comprehensive Plan, um, which includes prioritizing infill areas, ensuring compatibility with development patterns, and reinvestment into the older neighborhoods. Uh, the city does not anticipate any negative impacts to the surrounding area and services are available for development. 
but any future development proposed would be subject to a development review uh, to ensure conformance with city codes. So for public noticing, 38 letters were sent to property owners within 500 feet. Uh, we also posted signs on the property and placed a notice in the newspaper. Um, we have received no citizen comments or inquiries to date. And the Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval um, at this November meeting. And I have the motion here on the slide for you. Um, that concludes my presentation and I can certainly answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Brittany. Questions for Ms. Hathaway? Councilor Butler, please. So I just wanted to double check. Um, we don't currently have a buyer um, asking us to change this. This is a kind of a preemptive um, forward thinking thing on our part. My last update, yes, but um, Director Himasath, um, he may have a better update on if a buyer is um, slated for that or under contract. Okay, we don't have anybody interested. We're just going to put that out on the market. So there's nobody specific we had in mind for this. Okay. Well, I appreciate okay. the forward thinkingness of it then. Additional questions? Seeing none, I'll open a public hearing on this item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Uh, because we are conducting our meeting virtually, members of the public have been invited to submit comments to the city clerk's office. Jerry, do you have any such comments? Your Honor, it's currently 701 and we've not received any comments. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, how about the virtual webinar? Uh, anybody in the virtual webinar that would like to give us commentary this evening? No, Your Honor. Okay. Hearing no uh, further public comment, the public hearing is closed. Uh, I'll entertain discussion and motion from City Council with a reminder that this item will require two motions. Your Honor, uh, I make a motion that based on the application received and the project summary in accompanying analysis, the proposed rezone from IL industrial low intensity to RM residential medium density meets development code sections 18.30.050, sub C, sub 3, B, E, F, G, and H. And therefore, the rezoning is approved. Second. Motion and a second with regard to 17A. All those in favor, in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Motion carries 7-0. Councilor Fitzsimmons, would you be kind enough to give us 17-B? Sure. Uh, make a motion to adopt the ordinance and publish with reference to title only. Thank you. Thank you. Motion and a second with regard to 17-B. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries 7-0. I thank you, Ms. Hathaway. Um, item 18 has been handled. Uh, the UNC update moves us to item 19, which is COVID-19 update. Mr. Otto, please. I'd like to introduce Dan Frazen, our emergency manager, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Roy. Good evening uh, to you, Dan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This will be your COVID-19 pandemic update for December 15th. I'll just give you some quick highlights and updates to the situation report in your packet. Uh, starting off, our number one, the numbers are looking better. We're seeing significant increase, I'm sorry, decrease. Uh, the Well County is now under 1,000 cases per 100,000 in a 14-day period. Uh, we need to get to 375 to go to the orange level. We'll stay in red until we probably get to there. But our other numbers, uh, such as our positivity rate for the county and our hospital numbers decreasing, that puts us at the orange level in those two categories. Uh, current positivity rate for the Greeley-Evans metro area as of tonight uh, from Will County Public Health, we're at 12.12%, which is much better than the 15 and 16% we we're seeing a few weeks ago. The other thing I wanted to provide a brief review of the COVID testing programs for all city employees or for our city employees. Um, as you know, we had the antibody testing program for first responders. We had Greeley Fire and Greeley Police in the Curative Live Virus Testing Program. That's a state program. Um, they provided the test directly to uh, fire to help with first responder testing. And now we have a new COVID-19 testing program. 
the Water and Sewer Department placed a resource request with the state of Colorado for rapid antigen point of care test kits to help monitor the city's critical infrastructure workers for infection. Uh, these antigen test kits are real similar to the ones that uh, the UNC president was talking about. And there are live virus tests that show an immune system response and the results are, uh, they get back in about 20 minutes. So the city received over 5,000 test kits from the state and Greeley Fire has created a pilot program to test city workers with these test kits starting tomorrow. So we'll uh, give you an update on how that's going in uh, future briefings. Uh, number three, just wanted to mention the current facilities. Highland Hills Golf Course uh, reopened today after a suspected outbreak with some maintenance workers. Um, and then our drive through community testing site, still doing really well. Average about 200 tests a day. Uh, today was 271. And uh, the testing positivity rate is fairly high, but people are obviously going there when they're not feeling well. Uh, and then our final point that I want to bring to council tonight, uh, we, we are continuing to do research on the five-star business certification program to help out our local businesses. And um, there was some guidance, a checklist provided. It's a little bit vague, but it was provided today by the state. Uh, and I, uh, we, uh, several of us have meetings tomorrow with Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to figure out exactly what our role as a municipality is and it looks like we'll have the option to run uh, some type of program, uh, but we don't quite know what exactly that'll look like yet. And I know Mr. Otto wanted to uh, speak on this as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, Roy, could I take questions for Dan first? If you absolutely, would, sir. Uh, questions of our emergency manager? Councilor Hall, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dan, I, I have heard a number of times that there are apparently some over-the-counter test kits that are floating around but they're not really all that effective but yet the testing that we have at test sites seems to be effective um i mean i don't understand why people are going into the over-the-counter kind of stuff right now and and not getting good results back or get i heard today that one person did it and hasn't received a result for three weeks. So I'm just wondering why would someone want to do an over-the-counter test? Yeah, I, I agree with you, sir. I think now that we have the good options in our community with the kiosk at UNC and with the drive through out at 65th Avenue, the youth sports complex, uh, both are open seven days a week and the test results are coming back in two or three days. Um, I think that's the best option. Absolutely the best option. I've heard and, and read articles about the this similar antigen testing that you can buy over the counter. Um, and it does have some false negative results. So um, the positive results are usually pretty good. The negative results are kind of questionable, so. Thank you. Councilor Zeta, please. Thanks, Mayor. Dan, I forgot, I don't have the chart in front of me. What would be the positivity percentage rate that would push us back down to orange? Is that the next level down? Yes, ma'am. We have to stay under 50%. So with that 12.12%, or I think across the county, we're at 13 something. Um, so we're in that range. We just would have to keep that for two weeks. Uh, two we weeks? Need, yes, ma'am. But we need to see those cases um, per 100,000 come down. What's the day count on this 12.2% right now that we're at? How many days left until we could be into the yellow cat or orange is what I'm asking. Um, it just came down fairly recently, so I'd, okay. have to, I'd have to research that and send you an email. But. So probably about another two weeks, and then we look at there another week, or who knows? Yeah, if those if those total not the cases per hundred thousand in fourteen days came down, and we were able to stay under that fifteen, then yes, then we can transition. So then, what kicks that up to the state level that would move? Weld, or Weld County, we'll say, not just Greeley. What, is that something that needs to be decided on at the state level, or is that kind of an automatic thing and we can start operating again at that previous level? Yeah, the state would decide and they would dial, um, our, our ranking on the dial. Okay, thank you. Uh, looking at the numbers at the, in, the, in our, new, our surrounding counties, uh, probably a lot of us would switch over about the same time. Okay, thank you. 
Councilor Butler, please. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, so, Dan, um, I've heard, I've read a lot about um, the vaccine rollout. Um, my question kind of is, um, who is going to be handling that in Greeley? Is it going to be mostly county, mostly state, um, or do we are we still looking at establishing that plan? I uh, know the the state has the plan, um, and it's the Colorado National Guard that uh, is ro is distributing. Um, we have Pfizer in Colorado now, should be in Greeley uh, tomorrow or the next day. And then the Moderna, once that's approved, that'll be here as well. Um, but yeah, it's a state plan and it's supported by local public health, so Well County Public Health. And then we, my office, uh, the two lieutenants and I have offered to do anything we can to assist as well, as far as getting that to uh, essential workers, uh, frontline workers, the uh, long-term health care, and then our first responders. Sounds great. Additional questions of our emergency manager? Uh, seeing none, we thank you as always, Dan. Mr. Otto, you're up, sir. Yes, uh, council members, you can check your uh, council uh, email inbox. Um, I sent out an email late this afternoon, and I apologize for the lateness of it, but uh, the issue of the five-star program is, is moving very rapidly. You may recall Last Tuesday, um, I briefly discussed with you a proposed five-star program that the chamber had worked on. Um, today, they went and uh, presented that, as I understand, to Weld County to see if Weld County would be willing to submit that uh, for approval um, by the governor, and they declined uh, to do that. So you heard in, in Dan's presentation that uh, some of the information that I gave you appears to allow municipalities to apply for a five-star program as well. So I've um, asked um, our city clerk, uh, Anissa Hollingshead, to um, lead up, in essence, kind of an internal task force to see how we could potentially create our own um, city administer, uh, in, administered program using staff potentially from uh, community development, maybe in codes. Obviously our police department would have to be involved. I'm thinking that potentially some of our folks in uh, culture parks and recreation due to some of the shutdowns that we have in that operation, uh, as well as our EH2 um, staff could be involved in helping us prop up a program that would allow us to open our restaurants um, even in a red status. So we'll be working on that over the next couple of days, maybe be able to give a written update to council um, in the um, uh, packet on uh, Friday. If it's urgent that we create a special meeting of some kind to move forward with that, obviously we'll be in touch with you accordingly, um, but we think it important to investigate all options that we have um, as a municipality to get this moving forward now that uh, it seems we do not have the support of the county to go to the governor and have them make a um, application on our behalf. Councilor Clark, please. So Roy, it looks like even if we get in that program, we're only opening up 25% of our, you know, 25% of the restaurant. So I, I guess my problem with that, well, there's two problems. That's not going to make anybody uh, profitable, or, or, get, or it's really going to let them limp along, or maybe not even limp along. So I, I have some issue with that. But the second issue I have is, what are we going to do about the businesses that are operating that don't want to be part of that program? Next thing you know, we're sending the police out there or somebody out there to have a problem with someone. And the legislature has already told us that they don't even want police having a problem with someone with a knife, much less somebody that that, that doesn't monitor people wearing masks in their restaurant or has too many people in there. So I think we're opening a whole can of worms here. And I'm not a, I guess I'm not overly, I, I get what you're saying about researching it and giving us the, the knowledge about it, but I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. Well, and I hear what you're saying. So let me take both of those comments um, in, in turn. I, I agree with you. The vast majority of folks would want to be at least open at 50%, which um, we were at over, over the summer. The, the state regulations are the state regulations. I don't think they're going to allow us to jump a couple categories, so to speak. Um, but, um, you know, we may be back to, you know, orange and maybe we, we, we put ours in, in place that basically says we jump, we go backwards one color for each, uh, you know, stage of, of the virus that we're in to try to increase that. 
Um, I would submit to you if that is nothing is put in place, then nobody can be open legally. And what happened uh, before Thanksgiving is at a risk for every single one of our businesses that they could have the state show up and confiscate liquor licenses and et cetera for operating at all. So we are, we're trying to open up something to that extent. The other challenge as it relates to, you know, what you're talking about relative to the police and others is the issue of enforcement. Um, the state will not allow us to have a five-star program without some level of enforcement on that. Um, I think this council has been very clear to me on what their philosophy is. It's not a draconian enforcement procedure by any stretch of the imagination, but um, there has to be some type of enforcement around the boundaries of it, or there's no chance for the state to open up, um, allow us to open up any of our businesses from that standpoint. And then they're all running the risk if they are open of, of running um, foul of the state. And uh, the state does have the authority to take away uh, their liquor licenses from that standpoint. So we're looking to try to figure out, is there a happy medium to try to help our businesses to keep operating? Obviously this council has been very supportive on the financial side as it relates to um, contributing dollars towards uh, various grant programs, et cetera. We are still working on those. We are anticipating additional uh, money coming from the state, from the Senate bill um, that was passed during this most recent um, special session. We'll be uh, working with the, uh, the chamber to, to um, distribute those dollars as well. Uh, but we wanna look at all options. It's ultimately council's decision is how you'd wanna proceed with that. Um, but without a program, we know we're basically just at the mercy of whatever happens with the virus and then whatever designation of color that the state makes and you can only be open to whatever the level they say at that period of time. And we're trying to make sure that people can at least stay open um, at the red, red level as well. You know, my hope in some fashion is we'll do all this work, uh, Council Member Clark, and then as Council Member Zazeda talked about, by the time we have it ready to go, we'll already be down into the orange, but that's where I start thinking about maybe what our proposal should be is you always skip back one um, level based upon whatever um, the state level is at, as long as we are working with our businesses to be compliant with what those standards are. Roy, I do want to supplement one thing you said uh, relative to the chamber. The, the task force, the recovery task force has stood up this week. We uh, met this afternoon and are ready to make some grants again. That is not with city dollars. We don't have those city dollars right now. Uh, that's with some funding that that task force had left over. Um, so, the, you know, and it is targeted right now at restaurants and bars. Um, so, you know, if you run into anybody out there uh, running a, a restaurant who is in need, need of financial help right now, uh, we are, our goal is to mobilize that money within, uh, I don't want to put too much time, but we're meeting twice a week to try to mobilize that money as fast as, as possible. Appreciate that, Council Member Payton. And I also want to thank um, the Chamber for their efforts in putting together a draft um, of a proposed uh, five-star program modeled after what um, the state was working on, but as well as what some of our neighbors are, are working on in Larimer County, as an example. As I understand in a meeting that I had this morning with the Loveland City Manager, Larimer County submitted something last week. It was rejected and sent back for some of those inspection you know um, types of issues needing to make sure that that is more firmly in place before they would uh, provide a five-star program for Larimer County so uh, we're trying to do the same thing they did submit through the county um, over there as opposed to individual cities as I understand. Brad how can we help market that from our standpoint and or maybe it's being marketed uh, sufficiently already? No I, I do I you know um I, I was honestly a little bit surprised. We did launch the marketing uh, at the end of last week. A um, little bit surprised we were, I, with the number of applications we had today, it was a little bit smaller than, than what I think we expected, the group expected. So, um, you know, I think, you know, maybe on the city website, turning, turning people towards uh, that application, which I believe is through the chamber website, um, um, and, and getting that word out there would be beneficial, Mayor. Okay. Uh, we, we will address that in the work that uh, um, the task force that I was talking to you about is doing. We'll also um, have the um, discussion that uh, 
Council Member Butler um, brought up earlier uh, included in that as well as to how we, um, you know, promote um, people going to our um, restaurants um, uh, and take out and that type of, of thing as well. So I've spoken, uh, I'm sorry, Ed, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, John, I was just gonna, I was gonna ask for additional dialogue from council to see what kind of how you guys feel with regards to uh, having the police enforce, go around to different places and enforce this kind of stuff where they're obviously gonna find some people that are gonna be discontent with them and they're gonna have a problem with them over a mask or a uh, how many people are sitting at their table or a business owner and. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely hear you, Ed. I guess I, my point all along is uh, uh, that that while I personally, as the mayor of Greeley, I'm going to support the the governor's public health order that I that I don't want us to be enforced. That's my opinion. Um, I've talked to so many restaurateurs over the last two weeks. Most of them that I've spoken to have reached out to me. I've reached out to a couple of others, and. I favor at this point doing anything we can to help them um, because they're hurting and they're telling me two things. Um, that takeout appears to be way down from where it was the first time we went through this, which I'm not too surprised that some of it might be the weather and people don't even want to do takeout when it's cold. I don't know, I don't want to speculate, but uh, the other part of it is that I had one a really prominent restaurateur in Greeley tell me today that it's uh, it's COVID apathy, and I think he's probably right. And to to Councillor Butler's point earlier about anything we can do to encourage people to take out to uh, to another point you made, Ed, which I was surprised uh, to hear, twenty five percent doesn't seem like our restaurants can make a go of it. Today I ask three. Um, three restaurateurs, uh, two, two, actually two restaurateurs, a pretty good size and a bar owner, whether they thought 25% um, was a plus right now. And unequivocally, they said, absolutely, because we are not making it on carry out. So my, I guess my posture on that has changed a little bit and I, I don't like the enforcement side. Um, I'm disappointed that the county's not, uh, wouldn't accept that variance to pass it through. That's that's their call, not ours. But I want to do what we can for our restaurateurs and the bar owners um, and the gym owners that are struggling mightily because I want to see them get through this. And there are things out there that'll help. Um, the, the money the county made available um, through their trust to fund will count that um, will help. The mayor or the money that uh, Brett talked about from the chamber will help. Um, but I, I feel like we can't sit on this any longer. That's just my posture. Um, we have to look at the enforcement bit down, down the road. To, to your point, Ed, if for people that are getting variances, there, there is an enforcement component that it sounds like we're on our own. And it's a double-edged sword dilemma of getting our restaurants open to 25% and then having to have somebody be the heavy um, the only other point I would make about some of the restaurateurs that have called me is, and you all know this, we have a real hybrid in our community of, of restaurants and bars and gyms who are doing what the public health order says, Governor Polis's order, whether they like it or not. And there's an assortment that are not, and their restaurants may be not just be at 25% or may not be at 50, they might be full. And to say that there's some dissension brewing in that regard would be an understatement. I don't know that that's our problem. Business owners make a conscious choice based on what they believe. But I feel like the benefit of being able to help our small businesses with the potential of getting a variance outweighs the enforcement, part, which, again, to your point, Ed, I don't like that part a bit. That's my two cents. I'm, I'm not sure where the rest of you uh, land on this. Councilors, as Ada, please. Thanks, Mayor. Good points. Um, Roy, if I'm understanding this correctly, we need the enforcement portion. Since the county is not willing to do it, the enforcement falls on us, correct? Am I correct in this thinking so far? 
Anybody who applies for um, a five star is going to have to have a force been associated with it. You'll see that in the documents I sent to you, or the, there's no chance for the state to approve it. You know, it, it, I understand what Council Member Clark is talking about. It, it's not a fun position to be in, but with no enforcement of the standards, there's no program. And uh, that's basically what happens when it comes right down to it. So if we didn't do that, it's exactly where it is right now. And those who want to roll the dice and try to operate the way they are without having the state come in and um, penalize them for that, they can take that risk. But if we were to do this and have a program, then there's no concern, as I'm understanding, of the state coming in and enforcing and shutting anything down. And then we can handle how we want to deal with that. I would, I would submit to you that our first line of defense is always going to be a warning, counseling, discussion, et cetera. But if there's somebody who's not willing to follow those regulations, the state would expect us to uh, take some type of enforcement action against them to ultimately have a five-star um, put in place and to allow it to stay in place. So we're charting new territory in essence. This is not something that's been done before. I totally agree with Ed that I don't like the thought of our police officers having to enforce this because number one, they're already getting enough heat. Number two, it seems like putting a really heavy hand on something. Are we able to get creative and have our code compliance enforce it? Well, is, I mean, anybody can, but it's the same situation. It's still the city that's coming in and citing them, whether or not it's a police officer or code enforcement officer or somebody else that's deputized. They, they're going to want some measure of, of folks that are um, A, administering, that you're registered the program, this is what you agree to, and then some level of enforcement. Um, I don't envision that we're gonna have people going to every business every single day. My guess is it would be more on complaint basis and that type of scenario. Those are some of the details that we'll work into, but it, it comes down to there has to be an enforcement entity who yeah. that person actually is is uh, you know is up in the air, but ultimately it would be a city official that would be issuing some level of um, citation if somebody was not following the order, as I understand um, the regulations of what they would uh, accept at the state for a five-star program. So I'm gonna propose to my fellow council members and really hope you guys will think about it. There's a huge difference between having a police officer come to your place of business and having somebody in code compliance. I 110% would like to see that as a code compliance person, not a police officer. And in that case, I will wholeheartedly support this initiative and try and help out our restaurants. I would say a code compliance officer or someone else deputized, as Roy said. To, to clarify, I would also agree with that, though. Good, uh, good dialogue. What else? What else do you have, Council? And I know Ms. Hollingshead is listening as well, so please, thank you. Uh, any of your feedback does help us as we um, uh, put that in. And, and Council Member Zazeda, I, I apologize for interrupting you before you completed your uh, thought. I can I can support what I can support what Council Member Zazeda said. I don't want to see the police getting involved in any of this stuff, but I'm not in favor. Roy, well, what about this? So, so if if we have a different business that's not in the five star, but they're still operating, are we going out there um, and enforce, that, enforcing are, them? Yeah, I mean the five star, as I understand it, Council Member Clark, is what you're saying is is legal within the city, and if some you don't necessarily register to be a five star you know, restaurant. We're basically saying that these these are the, the boundaries or the um, regulations that are allowed for, for a restaurant to open at this point. So if somebody did not work with the city to say, hey, this is what we're going to do, please sign off on what we're, we're doing. And they, they're running a, a, a foul of that. They would be in violation of what the law would be at that period of time. And they would be subject to a citation of some kind. And one of the, the things I heard you saying as well, Council Member Clark, and I wanna make sure that I'm understanding you as part of what your concern also is as a result of Senate Bill 217, et cetera, you're, you're concerned about putting those police officer and their post certification issues at risk for this issue as well. Is that correct? Right. Thank Absolutely. you, sir. I appreciate that. So Roy, uh, quick question. So the, I mean, I, it sounds like you, you need to move through what 
the state is going to be accepting as an application and whatnot. Is it so? Is there a state mandated enforcement? In other words, they're saying this is what we expect from enforcement. I have no idea what that would be. Or do we get to design that and say, here's our intention? We want to bring some folks on part time to do some court code enforcement, and you know, I mean, we get to design that ourselves. It's my understanding we we uh, design it ourselves, but you'll see in the PDF that's attached um, to the email that I sent to you. Uh, there's a, a several types of things that they're saying we must make sure that are being uh, adhered to, and one of those issues is enforcement, but it doesn't. Um, specify exactly what that enforcement looks like, we would be required to put that in our proposal, as I understand. Okay, yeah, so I'd be interested in, in you know, you moving forward much along the lines of what Council Member Cezeta mentioned, trying to figure that out. I, I you know, this council, this council doesn't want to operate with a heavy hand, um, but by the same token, you know, we I, if we we need to do something, you know, for those for we need to try to spread out as much as possible the the positive impacts we can bring. Yeah, and one of the things that I've thought about as it relates to the issue of enforcement as well. I mean, the state obviously doesn't have the number of staff members available to go statewide to be going to every restaurant and things along those lines. Our friends at Weld County government don't have enough restaurant inspectors to do those types of issues. So there there has to be some measure of reality and, and resources available to apply towards this. But I, I just feel a sense of this council's desire to support our local restaurants here and for us to exhaust every avenue we possibly have to do that. And that's kind of the spirit um, behind um, what we're looking at at this point. It's definitely not to go and, and ticket people who are you know, not doing it per, uh, appropriately. We're trying to open an avenue for these folks to be able to get some level of, of business still going on. Councilor Hall, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I guess I was, when I was reading about this or hearing about this five-star program, it seemed like to me it was more of a, um, it's a certification that the individual to, uh, restaurant would have to come up with that they would certify that they're going to do this and then the response would be that we would make sure that they're they are in compliance but I don't know that we would want to say that anybody outside of this program can um, that that we would then go after or even attempt to go after their violation of this program if we were trying to do it from from a really standpoint, and it seems like to me that we would want to try and have the positive outweigh the negative and work with those that want to try and open up in a, in a positive manner, and become certified and, and go from there. And those that aren't going to, you're going to still have them no matter what we do to it. And so we're kind of, if we do nothing, we're more or less allowing the, those that don't wish to follow the rules continue to, to be the way they are. But I think if we can do it on a positive level, we can have some ability to help those that really do want to work with everybody and become a good citizen. Councilor Butler, please. Yeah, for me, um, I'm in favor of doing this because I want to make sure that we're protecting the liquor licenses of those um, restaurants that are, are following the mandates. I think that that's, that's the, the key piece of this because when I'm, when I'm talking to restaurants, a lot of them are like, I want to reopen, but really it's unsafe right now to do, and I'm not entirely sure how to do it, but more importantly, I don't want to risk, risk my liquor license. That's, that's the number one piece of this. And I think that this is, this is a way to keep those, those businesses afloat and help them keep their liquor license, which is, I think, a huge part of a lot of these restaurants. That and the other part I heard to your point, uh, Tommy, is that uh, in addition to the liquor license, uh, some of them don't want to open up because they don't want to be shut down by a health department. It, clearly, Well County Health Department is not going to do that. But the question is, at some point, will Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment travel around to various communities and do that? And that's an unknown. But the, some of the restaurateurs I talk to are keenly aware that that's possible. Councilor Fitzsimmons, please. I 
support this also. And what my question to Roy, what's the timetable? I know that I don't want to belabor the fact of we're in the red now and who knows when we'll go in the orange. Does the five does that change when the colors change as far as enforcement and what we can do and not do? That's an excellent question, uh, Michael, um, or sorry, Council Member Fitzsimmons. I, I really don't know for sure. I mean, that's how fast it's going. That's um, part of what I was wondering out loud when uh, Council Member Zeta talked about, shoot, if we get to orange, if I remember correctly, orange level said you could be open at 25% capacity. So why would we have a five-star program that says you can do what the law already says you can do? So maybe that's where you create a little bit of a sliding scale to if we go orange, our business are act actually open at yellow level. And if we make it to yellow, it's blue, if that's the next color, that type of thing. I do like the blue and, and gold colors, by the way. I, th I think those would be fine, you know, my, my fellow Wildcat fans. But uh, that, that's maybe what that is. And then the other thing, Councilmember Hall, I, I want to look into is exactly what you're talking about. Is it actually these people are opting in? And so you're administrative responsibilities just to work directly with those businesses who have opted into that. And the balance of that is just out towards um, the state um, to enforce and the like. That's a very excellent question. I want to make sure that I understand that well and the work that we will be working on. The time frame, Council Member Fitzsimmons, on how long it takes you to prop that up, I, I, I don't know for sure. I mean, clearly it's going to be difficult. We're going to be moving into the Christmas week next week etc. Um, but, you know, I know that it'll take at least a week or so for probably the state to review and approve your plan. And then we have to get to the point of communicating with the businesses and how they register and how we get propped up to be able to see what their plan is, certify that, etc. Um, administratively. Um, my guess is we couldn't be much up and running until uh, the middle to maybe even late January from that standpoint. Thank you, Roy. And I do want to say too, I, I agree with uh, Council Member Clark and Council Member Zazeda. I'd like to see others than our police force out there doing the enforcement. I think they can do, they have their hands full anyway with other issues. And I think if we as a city can do some code compliant officers, that would be something I would support. It, it is a fact that if we end up at Orange, we're back to 25% open. It appears as though we might be away from that, um, unfortunately. Councilor Clark. I just wanted to, I, I haven't gotten any calls about the restaurants. And I, and I know a lot of restaurant tours as well, uh, but I know a lot of people call the mayor. Um, but my question is, can we have somebody from the city actually do a poll? I, I just don't see how 25% is going to, I mean, maybe it does with the carry out. Maybe, uh, John, that's a great point. I didn't think of that. But you know, at twenty five percent, that's not that's not a that's not a that's not a win. And what it is is, is it is kind of pushing the governor's agenda to have. He doesn't have enough people to come up here and do all that stuff. So so he's 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 going to have us do it. And I think that uh, that's I mean that's that's troubling to me. I, I I'm a biz, pro business guy. I donated to the Greeley Recovery Fund. I I want that the businesses to be successful, but I don't want to step into something that we can enforce. And, and I, I was talking about what Dale was talking about. I, I'm good with, if you wanna opt into this program, but I'm not good with if you're not in the program and then you're all of a sudden we're enforcing people outside the program. I, that's, that's, that's something I don't wanna be involved in really. I think that part might be one of the unknowns, um, frankly about the folks that don't, don't want to uh, opt in. And I, you know, I'm happy to chat with you all further about folks I've talked to. I'd rather um, not do it publicly. I'll talk sure. to you offline because I don't know that they would want that shared, but there's, there's a, I hate to say there's a common theme, but there's a common theme in the ones I've talked to, which to be fair, even though it's quite a few is a pretty small representation of Greeley. They, they are some higher profile establishments, but they're not, they're, they are not large numbers, no doubt about it. Can we check that, Roy? Are we going to be able to do? Can, can we have somebody kind of run that, run an independent survey for us? Or? Yeah, potentially. And, and I think you know we need to to lean into the chamber as well because I know they were reaching out to their membership a lot in the proposal that they put in together. Um, I will let you know, Councilmember Clark, when I was 
um, before last week's um, briefing, um, short briefing on this, uh, was in a meeting along with uh, uh, council member, uh, or sorry, Mayor Gates. And I, I brought up the 50% issue as well. It was, well, shoot, um, I, I've heard from folks that say they can't really make it go unless it's at least at 50%. Why wouldn't we just put in our initial proposal that they could operate at 50%? And, and quite frankly, I think the vast majority of people have empathy for wanting to do that. Their question is whether or not the governor would ultimately grant a variance for that level is what the tension point is. So yes, we'll figure out a way that we reach out and, and determine that um, and try to get that data back to y'all. Thanks. Um, any additional questions, comments? It seems as though um, we've given Mr. Otto at least consensus to move forward and fact find um, with the idea that we might apply for this as a municipality. It, it, does, does everybody concur on that part? Okay. And and uh, like it's like uh, you know our manager mentioned this stuff's been coming together really quickly, but uh, we'll get you know facts available as they come out, and Mr. Otto knows them. We'll, we'll have them and. Uh, um, working uh, you know pretty closely with the with the chamber and upstate as well so we're all we all have a common common theme for sure I think we have perhaps concluded this item and could move to scheduling of meetings or other events mr Otto I'm done nothing further your honor <laughs> okay um, item 21 is a consideration of a motion authorizing the city attorney to prepare any required resolutions agreements and ordinances to reflect action taken by the city council at this meeting and at any previous meetings and authorizing the mayor and city clerk to sign all such resolutions, agreements, and ordinances. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries 7-0. Uh, so we are not slated to meet again, council, until January 5th in the new year. Thank God there's a new year coming. Um, as such, I want to wish you all, your family, city staff, and their families and our communities safe and happy holidays. Um, thank you for a productive meeting, and we are adjourned. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye.